Tonight as we look at the book of Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 20 and 21 that I'll read in just a few moments, but uh, what I want us to look at tonight is the Apostle Paul writing uh, to the Galatians. And uh, Paul, uh, in this letter uh, to the Galatians, it's not a, a long, lengthy letter, but what he has uh, to deal uh, with in this letter is so vitally important. We see Paul's wide vision. We see his keen logic. Uh, there's biting sarcasm as well as his vehement indignation and his warm love. And, and we see spiritual power. And what Paul was trying to do was to silence the Judaizers and to define what Christianity is, uh, the gospel. Uh, God's remedy for those that are lost. And, and so we see the law and the gospel and works and faith. The law, uh, which he is going to speak about, the law could not save. The law could not sanctify. Uh, the law brought death. In fact, as we look at this passage tonight in the book of Galatians, uh, the word liberty, which stands for freedom, uh, that word liberty is mentioned some 11 times uh, throughout the book of Galatians. Uh, the word for Christ is mentioned some 43 times. Uh, the word for law is uh, mentioned some 31 times. The word faith is mentioned some 22 times. Uh, the word flesh some 18 times. And the word spirit some 15 times. In the book of Acts, uh, chapter 15, in the King James Version, we read, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised, after the manner of Moses you cannot be saved. Then we see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh uh, be justified. And then in our text for tonight, Galatians chapter 2 Verse 20 and 21, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see the problem that was happening in the church there uh, at, the, at Galatia is that the devil, of course, had invaded the church through a minority group, and that group were the Judaizers. And what the Judaizers were doing, they had been filtrated the church. They were coming in, and they were mixing grace and law. And they were teaching that unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, that you could not be saved. And they're basically saying, now that you've started your relationship with God through faith in Jesus, and now that you have received the Holy Spirit in your life, then they were saying, now there's some other things that you need to do. And so Paul comes and he answers back in Galatians 2, 21 saying, I do not set aside, notice the grace of God, or there in the King James it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And uh, one of the other translations used the term, rather than frustrate, uh, set aside there. And so here the church at Galatia is not the only church that dealt with the Judaizers. They are still with us today. Let me tell you, the, the devil loves uh, to uh, create and wreak havoc upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil would love to move you out of the liberty of grace and back under the bondage of the law. And so whenever you begin to look at the law, and I'll just read a few of these from John Phillips' commentary on this particular book in the Bible. But you see, the death penalty was attached to the breaking of every one of the Ten Commandments. The death penalty uh, haunted every wrong act under the Old Testament law. 
And nowhere is this fact more evident than in the book of Leviticus chapter 20. And I'll just read a few of these. There are so many of these laws. But whoever he be of the children of Israel or the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. Another one stated, the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. Everyone that curses his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. The man that lieth with his father's wife, both of them shall surely be put to death. If a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall, shall surely be put to death. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with woman, both of them have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death. If a man live with the beast, a lie with the beast, he shall surely be put to death. If a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, they shall surely be put to death. And on and on and on we could go with the reading of those various laws. But the Judaizers were coming into the church and what they wanted to do was to mix the old law with grace. And of course, uh, you know, we're not living under the old covenant. We are living under grace. Uh, we live in the age of grace. And so uh, what uh, the Apostle Paul is trying to explain here to the church is that the salvation equation is not faith plus law equals salvation. But what he is trying to get across is that faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith in Christ plus nothing equals salvation. And so Paul says in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, when you start adding anything to faith in Christ for salvation, you're contradicting the very word of God. And it's God who declares us justified, and that means righteous. He declares us righteous. The Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible says our goodness, our righteousness is filthy rags in his sight. So the only way that you and I can stand justified, declared righteous, is that we stand in the righteousness of Christ once we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It's God who declares us justified, uh, which means righteous, when we turn to him in faith, believing. Now, how, how do you turn to Christ in faith? Well, Bible faith. Saving faith is just simply taking God at his word and doing what he says. When we do what God says, then we are exercising saving faith. We're acquitted of sin. We are made acceptable to God through faith in Christ. And what an incredible, wonderful, glorious Savior we have. You see, that justification is what declares you and me righteous. Uh, where we have a right standing with God. And Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. There are four things that I want to leave you with tonight about that verse in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Here are the four things that Paul says. Number one, it's personal. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. You see, that which is personal tonight. Do you see it? Paul uses uh, the personal pronoun I. He doesn't say you have been. He doesn't say they have been. He doesn't say he has been or she has been. Paul says I have been. It's a personal thing that each person has to choose to do uh, through faith in Christ and Christ alone. Are you tonight... One of those I have beens. You see, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It was a personal experience that he had with Jesus Christ. 
But not only was it personal, it was that which is permanent. It was that which is permanent. Notice he didn't say, I'm being crucified with Christ. He doesn't say, I will be crucified with Christ. He doesn't say, I'm trying to be crucified with Christ. But he emphatically, declarative, uh, uh, declaratively says, I have been. Notice that. It was personal to Paul. But not only was it personal, it was to be permanent to Paul. It had already happened. It was a done deal. It was permanent in the fact that Paul's confidence was in being identified with Christ. He uses the perfect tense, which speaks of something that has happened in the past, but the effects of it are permanent. It's personal. It's something that each one of us can experience for ourselves, but it's permanent in the fact that it's happened in the past. But the effects of it are unchangeable. I'm so grateful to know tonight that the day that I received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior on March the 24th, 1963. I want you to know I was 12 years old. And on that particular night, that which is personal and that which is permanent became a part of my life. And Paul would say to the Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ. And Paul was going to debunk for them that there was no other way but through Christ. Faith in Christ. Sola fide. Faith alone. Uh, and Paul is saying that which is personal and that which is permanent. And then a third thing that we can take away from that verse, I am crucified with Christ. It is that which is practical. Paul is saying that being crucified with Christ, that means several things. If you have been crucified with Christ, let me tell you, you are facing one direction. You've turned your back to the world. I love that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. You know, one of the greatest things in all the world that this world could ever do tonight would be to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, there's just a peace that passes all in human understanding when you follow Jesus. The song says, I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I can remember many, many, many years ago at Falls Creek, and many of you out there listening tonight can certainly identify with Falls Creek and all of the hundreds and thousands that have been saved through the ages at Falls Creek. There's just something about that hallowed ground where the Spirit of God has moved upon the hearts and lives of all ages of people down through the years of time since, uh, since uh, False Creek began. There's just something there. And whenever the choir would stand to sing and the orchestra would, would begin to play and the invitation would begin to be given. Let me tell you, and they would begin to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, uh, that is just something that resonates within the heart and life of all of those that have ever experienced that. Let me tell you, when we're crucified with Christ, it means we take up our cross daily and we follow him. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ has a blueprint. God has a, his blueprint for mine and for your life, for the present, as well as the tomorrows as they come and as they go. And Paul references this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when he spoke to the church at Corinth. Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, what is he? Paul says he's a new creature. He's a new creation. What on earth does that mean? It means the old things of our life, they're passed away. Uh, no longer does the allurement of the world have a hold, have an effect on me. You see, when the spirit of the living God is operating in the heart and the life of a Christian, when the Holy Spirit is moving within us and, and we are allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Holy Spirit, 
Let me tell you, all things become new in our life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. new. And when you and I are truly crucified with Christ, let me tell you, the things of this life, they begin to lose their appeal to us if we truly and genuinely have received Christ and we truly and genuinely are trying to walk in the spirit of the living God and we're trying to live right and to do right, the things of this life begin to fade. And the new life in Christ is where we place our focus. Paul's life changed forever. He was dead to that old way of life. Paul realized that the law could not save him. And so Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Oh, tonight, that every person that has ever come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, if they would just remember that Christ lives within your heart, through the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Your body, my body, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit where Christ lives in you and me. And let me tell you, wherever you and I go in life, we are taking the Holy Spirit of the living God with us. You see, when people see you and me, do they see the reflection of Christ who's living in us? Paul goes on to say in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live. Notice that. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I yet live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And notice how important that is. He goes on and he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh... Because you and I still have a fleshly body. Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me tell you, does the Holy Spirit control you? Does the Holy Spirit control me? You see, does the Holy Spirit make your decisions for you? You see, when you and I are are walking in the spirit of the living God. When we are being controlled by the spirit of the living God, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit will lead us to make the right choices, will lead us to make the right decisions. It's such a tragedy when a child of God slips back into that old former lifestyle of sin. And when you and I have been crucified with Christ, crucifixion has a way of branding itself into our minds and into our hearts. And so Paul is speaking here about being crucified with Christ. It was that which is personal. It was that which is permanent. But it is that which is practical. Christ living in me. Fourthly, it was that which is positive. You may never think about being crucified as being pos positive. But I want you to look at the last part of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul speaks about Christ who loved me, who loved me and gave himself for me. That really ought to resonate with each one of us tonight uh, to know that Christ loved me so much. Let me tell you, if you were the only person in the world that ever needed reconciliation with the Holy God, God would have stepped out of heaven's glory and God would have come because he loved you enough and he loved me enough to give himself for us. In Galatians 1 verse 4, it says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us, what? From this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Let me tell you, Christ's death. We speak about his vicarious death. That means his, he, he was the substitutionary atonement for our sins. Let me tell you, his vicarious death, he willingly submitted himself to be crucified on the cross so that you and I might have an opportunity to have eternal life through faith in him. 
and through his shed blood to bring redemption to the heart and life of those who would call on the name of the Lord. Galatians 2.21, Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness, how are you and I righteous? Not through the law. We are righteous because of Jesus Christ. A substitutionary atonement for our sins. And Paul very candidly, Paul very plainly debunks what the Judaizers were trying to infiltrate and to bring uh, corruption and uh, evil and wickedness into the church. And Paul very plainly says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so Paul goes on to say, uh, that phrase there, set aside, or the word frustrate there in the King James, it means to nullify, to regard useless. And then he says, you know, then Christ would have died in vain. That word vain means without cause, groundless. If you can save yourself through being good, self-merit, there would have been no reason for Christ to have died. But of course, you and I know that the old law was pointing people to the days when salvation would come through God's wonderful gift of grace. Let me tell you, if you could be saved by your own righteousness and self-merit, then you would just keep on trying to do good works, but good works will not get you to heaven. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ through his shed blood at the cross to cover our sins, let me tell you, we do good works because that's what you want to do once you receive Christ as your Savior. Just, you know, just if, you, if you're trying to live by the law, then you would continue to do all these religious activities to try to earn God's acceptance, but it is not by works of the law. It's either God's grace or it's nothing. Jesus was not only a sacrifice for sin, but he was the substitute for our sin. And so Paul says to the Galatians, I, it's a personal thing. It's a permanent thing. It's a practical thing, but it's a positive thing. I have been crucified with Christ. That is when Jesus died some 2,000 years ago, Paul is saying he died in my place. He died as my substitute. He paid the penalty. He paid the price for my sins. And in doing so, Paul was saying, I'm now dead to that old way of living. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a great comfort. What a a great Savior. Aren't you grateful tonight? Aren't you grace, grateful for grace? Grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Let me tell you, you and I are living these past 2,000 plus years in the age of grace, meaning Christ came, Christ died, Christ shed his blood to cover sins. Christ rose from the dead. Christ ascended into heaven. Christ is coming again. If you've never given Christ your heart and life, reach out, as the song says, and make that conscientious, intentional decision to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I hope if you've never met Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior. It's my prayer that you will reach out by faith, through faith, in Jesus. And say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You came to save sinners. Father, forgive me of all of my sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. 
and be the Lord of my life forevermore. I hope that if you've never prayed that prayer, that you will pray that prayer and receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Will you bow with me as we close tonight? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your marvelous grace. Thank you, God, for the peace that passes all human understanding. Thank you as we read what the Apostle Paul was writing to the Galatians to debunk the Judaizers as they were trying to mix the law and grace. And Paul let them know how it was. God, thank you that it's your wonderful gift extended to those who will reach out by faith and trust you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for your substitutionary atonement on Calvary's cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying in my stead. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me an opportunity to ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and life and be the Lord of my life. Thank you, O oh God, for that day. In 1963, when the Holy Spirit moved upon my heart and conviction took place, and through that conviction came a conversion experience. It was personal, it was permanent, it was practical, and it's positive. Oh God, I pray someone, somewhere out there, will receive you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for this Bible study together tonight with all of our church family and those who enter into our website and to listen to the live stream broadcast. God bless them, be with them, be with our, all of our church family, all of our church attenders. God, watch over them, keep them safe during these days. And God, we will look forward to the time that we can be back together again. Thank you, Father, tonight. Because you loved us enough that you would die for us and rise from the dead to give us life everlasting. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.